Ephesians chapter number 1, I want you to notice, uh, looking at the last two uh, verses in this passage, verses 22 and 23 is where we're at. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. If you found your spot and you got the strength to do it, the willingness to do it, let's stand together. We'll read these two verses and have a word of prayer, and you can just sit down and relax other than your right in hand uh, to take some notes. Uh, don't let that relax tonight, and certainly don't let your brain check out on me because uh, there's something in here that you need. It says, and hath put all things. What does all mean? All means all. That's all that means. And hath put all things under his feet, talking about Jesus, and gave him, talking about what God the Father gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all, which is his body, his body is the fullness of him that filleth all in all. You know what the church is supposed to be? You know what the church is not supposed to be is? It should be. Just like when Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You know what the church is supposed to be able to say today? Church is supposed to be able to say, if you've seen me, you've seen Jesus. Uh-oh. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a few there's a few groups out there that call them churches, and if you looked at them, you wouldn't see Jesus. You might see something, but it wouldn't be Jesus. But this is what the church is supposed to be. And the Bible says here that he, Jesus, is the head over all things. God has put everything, all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. He is the head of the church. By the way, this is in my church. It's not even your church. It's his church. And if it's any other way, it's not a church of his stripe at all. Let me pray with you, and we'll get into this message tonight. And I hope it'll be a blessing. I hope I can got enough voice to get through it all. Father, we want to thank you for giving all things under Jesus' feet. And making him over all things, ahead of all things to the church. And Father, what a privilege to realize that we, the church, are to be the fullness of every, we're supposed to be emulate him, we're supposed to demonstrate him. If people look at us, they should see Christ. And Father, we need help with that. You know, you, gave, you made him preeminent. You made him all-powerful. You made him everything, and he's worthy, and he's capable. But, Father, we, are, we find ourselves woefully short of anything that could be referred to as capable. So we need your help tonight. I pray that you'd give us strength and give us a vision for this position that you put us in and, and help us to strive to bring you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, what a challenge that we have. What a position that we have been put into. And I don't mean a position of, of uh, you know, Jesus is in a position. He's the Savior of all. He is the, 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 uh, the, the, the payment for all sin of all time. What are we? <laughs> We're the sinners that he paid for. You know, the head over all things. Let's just start right there. We look at, at in the book of Ephesians, and I know it's been a while since we started off in chapter 1, verse 1, but just to remind you, in Ephesians, God's laying out his will, his choice, his desire, his design for the church and for this time that we're living in right now. This is God's plan, and, and Paul writes it to the Ephesians with the Holy Spirit uh, pinning, causing him to write everything down, and, and he's telling the Ephesian church and us what God's plan is for them and how God wants to work in and through them. But Jesus is supposed to be. This is the plan of God. This is the will of God. He at Jesus is supposed to be the head of the church. 
And here we are in 2022 and having churches say, well, I think homosexuality is fine. I don't sound like Jesus in charge of that deal because that's not what he said. They got folks saying it's all right that, that folks live together. It's all right that folks cheat, steal, do this, do that, all kinds of things. And that's, listen, Jesus is supposed to be the head of this organization, not me. This isn't about my ideas or your ideas, my will or your will, my thoughts or your thoughts. This isn't about my opinion. You understand that your opinion and my opinion added up still are dung? In the heart, in the sight, in the eyes of God, what we think and what we desire means very little. I mean, if God started all over with Adam and Eve today, and, and he started with Jim and Tammy, I'm going to tell you we'd end up right back in the same mess we're in today. He started back over with Noah and his family, and we still ended up here. What am I saying? I'm saying that sometimes we get the idea as church members that, oh, well, hey, this is what I want to see happen. Can I remind you what you want to see happen, what your idea is really don't make a lot of big difference to anybody. Well, I, I'll, do, I'm, I'll never say anything again. No, that's not what I'm saying. Our, but we need to have the right mindset. Jesus is the head. When, it, it doesn't matter what decision we're trying to make. Should we take on a missionary? I hate cliches, but what would Jesus do? That really is what we're trying to get to. It doesn't matter whether we're buying a building or we're replacing carpeting or buying new chairs or new songbooks or uh, figuring out what we're going to eat for lunch. It doesn't make any difference if we keep in mind that Jesus is the head over all things to the church. It is his opinion. It is his heart. It is his desire. It is his desire. That's all that really matters. Sometimes we get too caught up with what we want, what we think. <clears throat> Wave at me, Paul. Wave at me. No, stick it up where everybody can see you waving at. You, you see him waving his hand? Why, you know why he's waving his hand? I said, well, sure, the preacher told him to. No, no, no. I, I told him to. That's true. But do you realize that he had to consent to that thought in his mind? And then his brain had to give his arm the instruction to come up and his hand the instruction to wave. Do you realize that? Now, I want you to say, preacher, what are you talking about? You're going crazy. No, follow me now. This is not difficult. You do not do anything you do not want to do. Right? I can't make you wave at me. If I can't eat, make my kids eat their mashed potatoes, I can't make anybody do anything. And I've tried many a time to make my kids eat their mashed potatoes, and if they ain't wanting to eat them, they ain't going to eat them. It don't matter how many days you save them. <laughs> they look pretty with greens and reds, but they won't eat them. All right, let's come back to serious a minute. I said, wave your hand, Paul. He, he reached up there and waved at me. He had to consent to that idea, and then he had to, his body, his brain had to tell his body, do it. And then he set to doing it. Now, what if he hadn't done it? Let's talk about this for a minute. What if he didn't do that? There'd be a, there might be a problem, right? He might be obstinate and disobedient and rebellious. That could be one of the problems, right? Sounds like most of us. But there could be another problem. It could be that his head didn't hear what the instructions were. It could be that his head didn't communicate with his arm and his arm didn't go to waving like this. You under, you, are you following me? But in any case, if I say to somebody, hey, do this, and they don't do it, mark it down, there's a problem somewhere. Could be a heart problem, could be a pride problem, could be, could be a physical problem, could be an emotional problem, could be some kind of problem in their body. But there's a problem. 
So let me ask you this. Why doesn't the church of Jesus Christ, who he is supposedly the head, doesn't follow his directions any better than it does? Can I suggest to you that it's one of those same problems? It's either a pride problem or obedience problem or a physical problem. Uh -oh. Why did it get so quiet in here, y'all? You went from laughing to looking real serious. Listen, if you start telling your body to do something and your body doesn't do it, can I suggest to you that you go see the doctor? Okay? If your body's not doing what your brain's telling it to do, you have a problem that you need to go see the doctor about. So what's the problem with the church? We need to go see the doctor called the Holy Spirit. We need to go see the great physician because there's a problem somewhere. It's either a heart problem or a head problem. I'm not sure which it is. But the church is supposed to be doing everything that is God's will. It is supposed to be following the instructions of the head who is Christ. And he's the head of all things. Say, so, well, I just don't believe that. I don't know. You can't help some people. And I want you to notice, this isn't a new problem. It started in the garden. Adam and Eve didn't listen, didn't follow instructions either. Come out of the garden. I mean, you can go all the way, start in Genesis 1-1 and follow through the pages of the Bible and write down every time that somebody disobeyed God. You're in for a long book. Listen, what am I saying? I'm saying we need to, you know, sometimes you just need to sit back and think about something and go, well, why is that? So that you can then realize, well, I don't want to be that way, right? Follow the nation of Israel through the promised land, and you really want to be that way? How many laps around the wilderness would you like to take? Right? Listen, do you want to eat the same kind of food until it comes out your nostrils? Then eat your mashed potatoes. Oh, sorry, I was getting, went back, reverted for a minute. <laughs> I got to make you laugh every once in a while, make sure you're still awake. Look with me, Ephesians 5. I know I'm getting ahead of myself, but just, just follow me for just a second. Do you realize that all Scripture is inspired by God? Do you understand that? And that every, there isn't one part that truly and truthfully contradicts another part. They're all, they all mesh together. They all support, every verse supports the other verse. So Ephesians chapter 5, notice with me 23 and 24 there. <clears throat> Excuse me. It says, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be their own husbands in everything. And all the men of the Lord uh, of God said, no, I'm just, this isn't about the, the men versus women. This is about Jesus and the church. Do you understand what he's saying here? There is an example that he's giving. By the way, do you realize that if adults... Let me give you a clue here with kids. If you got kids, this might help you. If your kids seeing you breaking the law and being rebellious and not wanting to do right, is it any wonder that they're going to follow in your footsteps and do the same thing? Okay? Now, again, sometimes you just got to sit back and go, well, I wonder why this turned out that way. And I'm, I'm just trying to clue you in a little bit. Let me, let me tie some strings together and help you understand. Listen, parents, if we are rebellious and we aren't going to do what's right, you can't really expect your kids to, right? Well, do as I say, not as I do. That never worked, never will work. Can I suggest sometimes husbands say, well, I just wish my wife would listen to me. And would, you know, it says there that, you know, wives should obey their husbands. Yeah, it says like Christ, like the church is supposed to obey Christ, right? Rebellion is 
probably, and this is just my opinion, all right? I'm, I'm entitled to my opinion, and every once in a while, I'll let you know what it is. My opinion is sin is more um, catchy. It, it, it spreads faster than COVID did. It's more deadly than COVID was for sure. Listen, sin will kill you no matter what. Listen, when a body stops being subject to its head, it's either very sick or dead. When a body stops listening to its head, it's either very sick or it's dead. You understand? The church is supposed to be subject unto Christ, who is its head. And he is the head of all things to the church. doesn't matter whether you like it or not, agree with it or not, or understand it or not. He is the head. And to the degree that we don't follow what the head says, we are sick. We have a problem. And we need to examine what that is. I want you to notice, continuing on with this thought, I want you to go back in our text and notice verse 23. It's, it's, it's kind of an explanatory verse there. It says, uh, speaking of Jesus, which is his body, the church is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The fullness of him that filleth, what is the church? It's the body of Christ. The gathering of the saved people. The baptized folks, the, the believers on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the church is. But it's also, according to this text, the fullness of Christ. And that word fullness means completeness or repletion. It's what is put in to fill it up, to make up the difference, to show what it is. Right? Now, understand something. The word church means a group of people that are called out for the same purpose. So, you know, in, in the, whether it's a group of baptized believers or whether it's a, the, the union or the, 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 the Boy Scouts or I don't know what you call them these days, but the Scouts, I guess we could just shorten it to the Scouts because of the challenges that they have, but... <clears throat> The reality is that that group of union workers get together. Technically, the word the word church in the Bible is it, it refers to that group, but they represent the union and, and whichever union they are a part of and whatever work type of work that they do. Maybe it's the carpenters union or the plumbers union or the electricians union, whatever it is. <coughs> when they get together. They can take a vote, and they can make decisions, and they can do different things, and they work as a unit. They represent whatever it is that they are. But when the church gathers together, we're supposed to represent Jesus. We are the fullness of him that faileth. And when people look at that group, this group, they should see Jesus. They should hear Jesus. They should, they should take from that, hey, that's Jesus' group of followers right there. Hey, listen, wasn't that the way it was back in the, Old, in the New Testament? <clears throat> Let me remind you, we're not going to turn back there. We've got other places to go, but Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, I will build my church, is what he said. Okay? The church, according to the Bible, is Jesus' body. That word, that, that, that scriptural word, ecclesia, called out group of people. They were called out. We were called out by Jesus Christ. And if we're called out by Jesus Christ, shouldn't we be following Jesus Christ? Shouldn't we be exemplifying Jesus Christ? Shouldn't we be listening to Jesus Christ? Let's look at 1 Corinthians. Turn back to the left a little bit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 18. 1 Corinthians 12, 18. I think, I think preaching is helping my voice, by the way. I'm starting to get things cleared out that I wondered if I'd get cleared out the rest of the week. But I'm, I'm thinking it's getting better as I'm going on. <clears throat> That's good. Get ready because Sunday's coming. 
1 Corinthians 12, 18, and I didn't get to preach a whole lot last Sunday, so look out. 1 Corinthians 12, 18 says, but now hath God, who, who's doing the action here? God's doing the action. But God, but now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath, what? Pleased him. Do you know why you're in the church? Because Jesus picked you up, saw you in your sin, saw how empty you were, and said, you know what? I'm going to make something of that. And he picked it up, and he says, now I want you to be a part of this church. I want you to be this part of this church. Man, some of you, he made a hand. Some of you might have made a finger out of. Some of you are an ear. Some of you are a mouth. Some of you are a toe. Some of you are a leg or a foot. I don't know. But God looked at you and he says, well, it ain't much now, but if I save it, <coughs> if I sanctify it, if I purify it, if I cleanse it, if I forgive it of all its sin and I put it over here, I can do something with that. That's what Jesus did with the church. And that's, what, by the way, <laughs> do you get to decide what you are? Oh, no. Yes, that's a trick question. Well, this is my life, is it? How many of y'all are saved? Say amen if you're saved. Amen. Is it your life? Or are you dead in Christ and risen with Christ? Saved by Christ. And get this. Saved, chosen, called, and then set in the membership by Christ. So why well, I don't want I don't want to be the sheep in the little pageant play. I don't want to be the shepherd in the I don't want to be the donkey in the shep in the little pageant play. Well guess what? If he saved you, he gets to choose which part you get to play. <laughs> we'll be a little bit more gracious with the little ones, okay? But as an illustration, we need to understand that as adults in Christ's church, if you're saved and you're sanctified and you're set apart and he's cleansed you of all your sin, he sets you in a charging. I can't begin to tell you how many people I've heard say, well, listen, if that's the way it is around here, I'm going to go be somewhere else. Well, listen, a few, few weeks or a month ago, you said God sent you here. If God sent you here, why are you going somewhere else? You realize sometimes God has to take a hammer to some of us to convince us that he's in charge? By the way, just so you know, as the pastor, do you know what I do? Okay. By the way, isn't that what the prodigal father did with the prodigal well, here you are. I'll be praying for you to get back. Some have said, preacher, aren't you going after them? Mm -mm. Nope. God does a better job of going after people than I do. God's hammer is bigger than mine and harder than mine. And sometimes it's softer than mine. It's certainly more accurate than mine. So, no, I, I don't chase people. I might remind you that, listen, if God sent you, why are you going, why are you going to go do something else if God sent you here? God didn't send you over there. God sent you here. You told me so. <laughs> well, I just don't like this. Well, again, is this your church or is this his church? I'm just asking. Is this your idea or is this his idea? I'm wondering. See, God is trying to build his church. He said, I will build my church. By the way, he said, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. If you're a part of what God is doing, you're on the victor side. <laughs> and if you're not, you're behind the wrong gate. 
God's building his church or his body. He's looking for a people to save, to set into his body, the church, to accomplish his will, not theirs, but his. I wonder if how many of us would say, I want to be a part of what God's doing. I'm willing to be whatever part God wants me to be a part of just so I can be a part of what God's doing. Well, listen, if I can't be the mouth, I don't want to be no part of it. If I can't be the one making all the decisions and all, making all the judgment, if, if things aren't going to go my way, listen, preacher, I just don't want no part of it. Well, just understand something. As far as I'm concerned, it's not my way or the highway, it's his way or the highway. You, you don't like his way? Go on. Because when he takes and swings his hammer and whops you up beside the head, I don't want to be in his way. Notice when the prodigal son was sitting in the pig pen, his daddy wasn't in there with him. His brother wasn't even in there with him. His brother probably went there afterwards, but he sat in there by himself. I wonder how many of us want to say, well, I want to be a part of what God's doing, regardless of what part that is. I was blessed. I was here early. The kids were coming in. They were getting ready, and they got the costumes out. And, and I, I, was, I was encouraged because what, you know what I heard? Well, I signed up to be a shepherd, and I signed up to be a shepherd, and I signed up to be a shepherd, and I signed up to be a shepherd. And somebody said, well, I think we've got too many shepherds. <laughs> I need somebody to be the wise men. And then I heard somebody say, well, I'll be a wise man if he'll be a wise man. And then somebody said, well, if he's a wise man and he's a wise man, I'll be a wise man. I think all three of them are wise. They're wise beyond their years. In fact, they didn't know what I was preaching tonight, but boy, they gave me a good illustration. Then I heard somebody else. Well, we, we got off a lot of this, and we need another one of those. Well, I'll be that if that's what you need me to be. Boy, these kids gave us some good sermon material tonight. You should have been here to hear it. You know, some people got this hang-up with being a toe. Well, I don't want to be a toe. Toes sometimes stink. Sometimes they get a little fun guy going on there. I don't want to be a toe. <laughs> well, you know what? Last time I saw somebody walk around with any toe, without toes, they had a hard time walking. The church needs some toes. Last time I saw a church didn't have any fingers. They were having a hard time getting anything done. We need some fingers. What am I saying? I'm saying it's, it shouldn't be what we want that's concerning us. It should be, well, what does God want? What does God need me to be? What, what, <clears throat> Let me give you a better way to figure out what maybe does God want you to be. Look around and go, what's missing? What's missing? Hmm? Well, no, listen. There's people. But there's, you know, I was encouraged. I was encouraged. Somebody said, Preacher, you think we could have a, a Christmas pageant? Yes. As long as you're not asking me to direct it. Absolutely, I'm for it, 100%. I think you're a little short on time, but I am for you, 100%. Why? Because if you just look around and go, well, why don't we have a Christmas pageant? Why don't we have this? Why don't we have that? Why don't we have a scripture ministry? Well, my church don't want to have no scripture ministry. I want a scripture ministry. I can't start one out there, but if you'll come here, you can start one. Listen. How many scriptures have we put out now? 165,000. Why? Because somebody said, Where's the need, and how can I, can I get involved in doing that? 
And now there's a bunch of you involved in putting scriptures together, giving to missionaries for free so they can reach people in their country and their language with the gospel. Why? Because somebody said, you know, a lot of you don't even, nobody knows that you're involved in the scripture ministry. Some of you, I may not even know you're involved in the scripture ministry. But do you realize whether I know or anybody else knows, the only person that really needs to know is Jesus. Missionary doesn't even need to know who's doing that. You could flip the back of that book open and sign every copy that you put together, but I don't recommend it. Because they don't need to know, and the person who gets saved don't even need to know, because Jesus has taken pretty good records of who's doing what. It's his church. It's his will. It's his idea. It's his design. And listen, there's a lot of opportunities for God's people. I mean, there's hands and feet and mouths and heads and ears and, and all kinds of things listed here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I wonder, let me ask you this question. Who's looking forward to seeing Jesus when you get to heaven? Anybody looking forward to seeing Jesus? Come on, be honest. Some of, some of you need to get saved. What is it? What is it that stands out to you? What do you think you're going to notice about Jesus when you see him? I mean, and I'm not talking doctrinally. I'm just saying, if you, right now, if you said, well, if I saw Jesus, I would know, and, and this is what I would notice about him. Anybody? Give me something. His hands, what's that? Long white robe, okay. Well, it don't even have to be doctrinal. It don't have to be biblical. I mean, I'm just, how many of y'all think he's got two ears? Y'all think he's got two ears? You think he's got two eyes, two hands, ten fingers, ten toes, two feet, two legs, two knees, two elbows? Yes, dear. Oh, amen. He'll be glad to see you. And well, that's a good thing to look for. But no, I have a specific reason I'm asking this question. We have a, a general idea of what Jesus is going to look like, right? Well, what if you saw him and he was missing an ear? Would you pass him by and say, well, that's, that's probably not Jesus? True or not? What if he didn't have the nail prints in his hands? Would you pass him by and say, that must be Paul or somebody else because that ain't Jesus? You following me? What if he was walking around on a crutch because one leg was missing? Would you think, man, that's Jesus? Look at Jesus! Or would you think, no, that's not him. I'm looking for somebody else. Come on, be honest with me. Now, let me ask you this. What we've been looking at tonight in Ephesians said that ch the church is the fullness of him that filleth all in all, right? So when the world looks at the church, should they not see a body with all its members and all its functioning parts? What if the world's looking at the church today going, wait a minute, that can't be Jesus' church because that's supposed to look like Jesus and talk like Jesus and act like Jesus, but it's missing some stuff. Because there's somebody saying, I don't want to be a toe. I don't want to be a foot. I don't want to be an ear. No, if I can't be what I want to be in the church, I'm going to go somewhere else. Is this coming awake for you guys? You go, you go understand what I'm saying tonight? Listen, in, when Jesus takes you and he saves you, cleanses you, and purifies you, and he sets you in a, can I suggest to you that he didn't set you here because you were so pretty? He set you here to use you for a purpose. <laughs> So you could be part of a body of Christ and you could emulate and you could show the world what Jesus looks like. Now, I hope you all understand something. The preacher's not mad at you tonight. I don't have a good voice and I'm trying to do my best to project and get you to understand something. 
we're supposed to show the world what Jesus is like. The church is the fullness of Christ. And he is the head. So when he says, do this, we ought to do it. Whether he says it to the whole or he says it to the part, he says, I want you to go out there and pass out scriptures on the side of the road over there by Buckeyes or somewhere else. I want you to go wave at the neighbors and tell them they could have a Bible that would tell them how to get saved. Oh, I can't do that. Why not? Is your arm broke? Did it stop listening to your head? Can you not pick up a, a, a copy of the New Testament and hand it to somebody who drives up and rolls their window down and says, what do you got? I got a Bible for you. Jesus told me to give it to you. Right? <clears throat> Excuse me. I didn't put any tracks in my pocket. But you know, there's tracks out there on the on on the welcome booth out there, could you not put some tracks in your pocket or in your purse and then as you go out there in the community tomorrow, look out there and say, hey, there's that person I keep seeing. Let me tell them about Jesus. I, let me tell you experience I had this. I pulled up to the Bank of Missouri. That was mo Monday, Tuesday. I took care of work Tuesday morning because her car was down. I drove up, to, I came back and I went through the drive through because the bank wasn't open yet, but the drive through was. I pulled in the drive through I put my checks in there to deposit, and I put a tract in there, and I said, here you go, there's two checks to deposit, and there's something in there for you. And the lady just smiled from ear to ear. Young lady, I don't know her name. She hasn't worked there very long. Most of the folks at Bank of Missouri know me quite well. But I said, there you go, Merry Christmas, I hope you have... And, and that's, that's for you. Please read it. She goes, you gave me one last week. I said, I hope you read it. She said, I did. I said, if you've got questions, call me. Okay. What am I saying? I'm saying, how can they hear without a preacher? And I'm not talking about me hitting every drive through and every teller and every. I'm saying that you go to some places I don't go. And if you don't put some tracks in your pocket, listen, there are people there. There's a gal named Evelyn, works at Conoco. She's worked there a few different times. She's an older lady. She's got a lot of health problems. She's got some other problems. But <clears throat> I was in there just the other day refueling. <laughs> refueling. My fleet is diminishing. That's really helping my, 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 uh, my fuel expenses, except I got to run more trips with the other ones. But, but in any case, uh, there was a, a Evelyn in there, and I went in there, and I didn't give her a track this time. I didn't need to because she knew exactly who I was, exactly what that track said. She, we had had enough conversations. I said, how you doing, Evelyn? Good. I want you to know something. I've been, I got onto YouTube, like you said, and I've been watching some of those sermons, and I got my earbuds in here, and I'm listening. So that's good, preacher. Oh, you did good. Yeah, but what about your gas station attendant person? How are they going to hear about Jesus? See, somebody's got to be the hands and the feet. And sometimes we all got to be that to, at some point. What am I saying? I'm saying find a way. Because how are they going to be able to look at Christ's church? How can they look at Heartland Baptist Church and say, yes, that's a church of Jesus Christ, if we don't care enough to even tell them about him? If they don't know we represent him? Do the people that you do business with, do they know they are representative of the body of Christ called Heartland Baptist Church? Do they know that? And if not, how are they going to know to what Jesus looks like? <clears throat> you know, Brother Lepar was mentioning the other day when he was preaching that sometimes when he's out there passing those Bibles out, that some of those folks give him that one-fingered salute. 
You know, us military guys, we're used to being saluted and, and saluting, right? But this is a different kind of salute, right? But you know what? They're not just, they don't know him from Adam. They don't know anything about him other than he's there representing the Bible and, and the church. And you know what they're saying? I don't want to have nothing to do with you, with that book, or with that church. You know what they're really saying? I don't want anything to do with your Jesus. And you know what? That doesn't bother him. It's not an offense to him. It's not an offense to me. Well, it's an offense to Jesus, but they're, I don't have to get, I don't have to, they're not going to give an account to me for that. They will give an account to him. Our relationship with Christ is represented by, are you ready? Our relationship with Jesus Christ is represented by our relationship with his body, the church. The church is the fullness of him that filleth. When people see you, do they see Christ through Christ's church and through your relationship with the rest of the body of Christ? You know, some of us are identified by many things. But one of the things that should set us off and should make us stand out to our community, one of the, the most and foremost things that, that we ought to be known for is being a member of Jesus' church. People ought to be able to look at us, whether we're in Walmart or Rosier's or the gas station or anywhere else. I know where they're from. I know what they're about. You are a representative, not of the church, true, but bigger than that, a representative of Jesus Christ. And I, I trust that Jesus is going to give you a part in his church. And part of that part is going to be telling the community and being an example to the community of the fact that you're a part of his church. And boy, what a work he's done in your life since he saved you. Let me pray with you. Well, I want to thank you for each and every one that's here tonight. And I thank you for allowing us, not just allowing us, but setting us, making us a part of what you're doing. And Father, whether we have appreciated that in the past, whether we've understood it in the past, I pray that you'd help us to have an appreciation of it and, Father, a desire for it even tonight. Father, show us what our part is. Give us direction. Give us understanding of what we can do. Set us in the members and in the membership and give us a real clear understanding of what our part is and is going to be and needs to be so that when the world looks at the church, they're not seeing a deformed, disfigured, half their entity that doesn't represent Jesus Christ, the perfect of the perfects, the, the one who is complete. Father, I pray that you'd help us to represent you well in this community. And we'll thank you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen.